Hi, I'm Brandon. I'm sure the overwhelming majority of people would accept the claim that suicide is horrible. It leaves people confused, devastated, but most importantly, it removes the possibility of closure. We should do everything we can to prevent suicide, but after all possible attempts to convince the person otherwise, then we should accept the fact that they wish to commit suicide. It is not our place as a society to force people to remain to live if they do not want to. We violate this person's autonomy because we cannot handle their decision of their own life. Hi, I'm Marcus. I agree with almost everything that Brandon said. Suicide is a touchy topic for obvious reasons. Where we disagree is the idea that at some point when all options have been exhausted, that we should just give up. No matter what, we should never allow someone to kill themselves. Nice to speak to you again, Marcus. Tell me, where do we as a society get off telling someone that they need to live to keep us happy? Why are we not taking into account how they wish to live or not live their own life? Greetings, Brandon. Hmm. I'm not taking the position that we completely override someone's personal feelings or desires. We should just understand what we can do to reduce harm to themselves and to others. We're taking into account how they wish to live or not. If suicide is generally accepted as a negative, then we should do all we can to mitigate that harm, thus preserving their life. I understand. But, if I may bring up an example, think about people with terminal illnesses. They've already received their diagnosis. This person, as well as family and loved ones, know that they will die at some point in the near future. If the victim is lying in agony for, say, the next two months, should we ignore them if they wish to die now? They don't want to suffer for the remainder of their life. Who are we to object to that just so we can hold on to them longer? How is that not selfish? Likewise, you could have a dementia patient who wishes to pass away before they lost too much of their cognitive abilities. They may want to depart from their family while they still know who their family is. Wouldn't it be much more sad to watch someone become a totally different person? While I agree that, in certain instances, death with dignity should be allowed. However, it's not completely equivalent to suicide. You see, in these scenarios you laid out, these people already know that there is little to no chance for survival. This is not the same for someone contemplating suicide. Someone who is suicidal can always bounce back from whenever they are mentally, from, I'm sorry, from wherever they are mentally and psychologically. If there is a way to see the future and know that they would not make a comeback before they commit a suicide, then maybe you would have more going for your idea. Hmm, that makes sense. Thank you. Now, I would hope you would agree that the way mental and psychological health is viewed in the United States isn't on the same level as biological health. People are afraid to admit to mental health disorders, but I don't see anyone out here hiding arm. If we were to do what we can to help destigmatize mental health in general, I'm sure we would see numbers of people who commit suicide drop as well. Hmm. While I don't disagree with that, that's a bit of a red herring. We are not discussing ways to prevent suicide. Even though your hypothesis sounds favorable, we are discussing what to do after all possible options have been evaluated and pursued. The original point of discussion of this discussion presupposes that we have already tried everything. We've tried therapy, counseling, things that make them happy. We've tried money, meditations, outreach, and nothing works for this example individual. No amount of talking and action has done anything to deter them from committing suicide. What do we do in this scenario? I'd hate to be that guy, but for many people, when they are constantly addressing something over and over again, they don't want to talk about it anymore. This happens with things outside of suicide all the time. No one likes talking about the same thing repeatedly, and now with this suicidal person, they are subject to it because of your good intentions. But how could we ever know if we've truly exhausted all possibilities? The thing or things that that person may need could pop up a week later or a month later. The fact that we do not currently know what would be helpful for this example person doesn't mean we give up on it. As long as the chance is not zero, then we keep trying. And this idea that they are getting annoyed? So what? At least if they are annoyed, they are alive. Do you know any dead people who get annoyed and frustrated? I sure as hell don't. 
If there's a person addicted to drugs, I don't care how much talking about it will annoy them. They obviously need help, whether they want it or not. First of all, I never said the chance was zero. I'm saying we don't know whether it's a zero chance or a non-zero chance. Like you said, we cannot see the future. What I'm saying is, is that each day this person remains alive, they are suffering. They are feeling the brunt of their life. You are telling them that we will do everything in our power to help them. But if there isn't anything to help them right now, they just need to keep suffering until we figure out that answer. Is that fair to the person? And my point as far as the annoyance is that people become more resistant to things when it's brought up repeatedly. Even if the necessary changes are ultimately beneficial, people will still be repelled by it. It may not be fair to the person, but it's also not fair to their loved ones. People who are close to someone who commits suicide can have a lifetime of distress over the situation. My goal is to maintain the well-being of as many people as possible. If someone's child commits suicide, the parents and siblings will most likely be affected until the day they die. Their friends will think about them all the time. Some of them may even blame themselves for not doing more. The suffering just doesn't end at the person who died. It multiplies through all the people they interacted with. Marcus I do not disagree with anything you said just now. What I'm saying is, what right do we, as a society, have to impose our desires over another person for our own satisfaction while they suffer? I'm not saying it's not sad. It's not like I prefer people to commit suicide. I just haven't found the justification in stopping them for my own benefit. There are many consequences people deal with if they try to commit suicide and fail. Now they have to go to a mental institution, which you could argue helps. Now they have to be monitored at all times to ensure their safety, which you could argue helps. I'm happy that they failed at their suicide and are still alive. However, the things we impose on them once we find out they've attempted suicide can lead them to feeling further isolation and depression. We can try all we can, but if they do not wish to live, you cannot force them to live. Because it does not just impact the victim and their loved ones. Think about all the people we would not save. Suicide rates would increase if we adopt your way of thinking. It is, in a way, enabling people to kill themselves. People may even decide prematurely that they have exhausted all the options. It could be an answer out there that the victim does not know, but a doctor down the street does know. This is why outreach is important. If we have an aspect of society that says, hey, at some point, we're just going to give up on you, we don't know the consequences of putting that out to people. People who are, are suicidal might see that and not even try to get help. They could think to themselves, other people tried all these things and they still committed suicide. What chances could I possibly have? Even if you wanted to test what would happen, one, you are testing with people's lives. Two, you have no way of knowing whether the increase in suicide is only from you allowing people to do it or if it's from people who gave up earlier because of this policy or any other extenuating circumstances. With something as volatile as suicide, we need to be sure before we implement anything at all. Marcus, you still did not answer the question about imposing on an individual's rights. Well, let me ask you, in this country, we have life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Do we, as our own individual, have the right to waive these rights? Hmm, that's interesting. I would say we do have that right. We can revoke our own rights in other senses. I'm not sure why these three in particular should or would be any different. Well, what if revoking these rights directly impacts the rights of others? It could be someone's pursuit of happiness to drink and drive. However, because of the possibilities of taking away other people's right to life, right to property, etc., we make it illegal. Yes, we are removing the person's liberty and how they are not free to combine drinking and driving, but it's for the greater good. This ideal is precisely what I am appealing to. I understand, but there are levels to this. Another reason why, another reason, excuse me, DUIs are a thing is because there's a certain amount of knowledge that the person has before committing the act. They know that they could kill someone else, destroy property, negatively contribute to a society that would be otherwise safe. By this metric, we shouldn't make anything illegal that makes people unhappy, for lack of a better term. It may be a feels argument at the end of the day. I feel like the person who is contemplating suicide should be able to take into account, just like the drunk driver, how their actions will affect people. 
If you have a family and friends that aren't giving up on you, then you shouldn't give up on them either. They may not be suffering anywhere on the same scale as you, but the moment the person commits suicide, I don't think you can say that anymore. Losing people we care about, seeing people we care about be hurt and go through terrible things tends to eat at people more than personal strife. What other reason would people use loved ones for ransom? I understand and I agree with you, Marcus. I'm not saying that the way we do things isn't right or that there isn't room for improvement. I, myself, just can't seem to come up with good answers to the questions I've presented to you. I can't really either. I just know that what you're proposing will most likely increase the amount of suicides without actually helping people. If someone is starving, shouldn't they hold out to the very end to see if they will find food? There's no guarantee that they will find food in time, and they're suffering each day. Should these people stop looking for food? I don't think they should stop looking for food. But if they do ever stop looking for food, I cannot hold it against them. And just because they stop looking for food doesn't mean that I have to stop looking. But I cannot force them to look for food, and I cannot force feed them either. You know, this is a sad talk. And I feel like there are no answers that help everyone. There are things we can do. But I don't think when it comes to this area, we will ever have 100% success across the board. Hey man, thanks for the chat. Likewise.